In this video, we're going to complete our look at cross tabulation by looking at one more measure of association, and that's gamma. And then we're going to look at what's called elaboration or post hoc statistical control as an advanced topic, but something that you're going to want to learn a little more about when you take the next course in statistics or in methodology. We discussed before that there's a lot of different measures of association you could use. We looked at Yule's Q. In the book, there's several others that they go through, four in particular. And you'll also find Tau's and Summers D if you look in other online texts or uh, on if you do Google searches. The measure we're going to look at here, the measure of strength of association, is gamma. Gamma is a pretty good measure to know about because it's a simple extension of Yule's Q, but it does have a particular use. That is, when your two variables are not only discrete, but when they're discrete, orderable. To be able to calculate uh, gamma, it's a little bit of work. You have to calculate how many untied concordant pairs there are and how many untied discordant pairs there are. It's actually pretty mechanical when you, once you get the hang of it and you understand what you're doing, but at first it can look like it's a lot of work. A concordant pair, what we're going to do is we're going to take pairs of observations out of your data set in the cross tabulation uh, for pairs of XY coordinates, that is the cells that they're in. And if a pair is concordant, one observation has higher rank on both variables than the other member of the pair. So you can see here when we use the term higher rank, this implies that there's an order among the measurement. We wouldn't use this for things like black versus white, but for measurements that have a greater than, less than kind of component. When you have a discordant pair, one member of a pair of observation ranks higher than the other member on one variable, but it ranks lower on the second variable. Again, the crucial word here is rank. If you create your table appropriately, and if you lay out your table with small values in the lower left, increasing as you move up and move to the right, this is a pretty easy set of statistics to calculate. Let's look at a layout of a table. There's a series of questions in the GSS that ask people about their confidence in different American institutions. The two that I've chosen here is people's confidence in labor and confidence in business. You can see at the intersection of these two, it's possible for some people to have a great deal of confidence in business as well as in labor, or to have any, hardly any confidence in business as well as hardly any confidence in labor, and of course, every combination in between. This is a 3x3 three three table, so calculating Yule's Q is inappropriate here. But the two discrete variables are orderable, so we can calculate gamma. Notice that as we go from the lower left to the upper right, that is as we move to the left along the bottom, as we move to the right along the bottom of the table, and as we move from bottom to top along our y-axis, the values go from low to high. If you set your table up in this fashion, it's pretty easy to calculate all the tied, sorry, all the concordant and discordant pairs. You need the concordant and discordant pairs to calculate gamma. It's a fair amount of work to get those pairs, but once you have them, the formula for gamma is pretty simple. It's just the ratio of the number of concordant pairs minus the number of discordant pairs over the number of concordant pairs plus the number of discordant pairs. Let's look at one cell. Let's look at all the people who responded that they have a great deal of confidence in labor as well as a great deal of confidence in business. So they're there in the upper right corner. We had 76 individuals who responded a great deal of confidence in both of these American institutions. They're concordant with the 602 people who are in the cell where they only had some confidence in labor and only some confidence in business. That is, a concordant pair is where one observation in the pair has higher rank on both variables than the other member of the pair. So if we were to take a person out of the a great deal and a great deal cell and compare them to the only some and only some cell, they rank higher on both variables. They're concordant. Similarly, those 76 individuals are concordant with the people who have hardly any confidence in labor and only some confidence in business as well as the people who have only some confidence in labor and hardly any confidence in business. And then finally, the last cell down there, they're concordant with the, peop the 111 people that have hardly any confidence in either business or labor. So if we put that together, we find out that the 76 individuals with a great deal of confidence in both labor and business are concordant with the 1,105 people who lie below them and to the left in the table, that is, rank lower on both of those variables. If we multiply those two numbers together, 
76 times 1,105, we find out that there's 83,980 concordant pairs comparing the a great deal people to everybody else. Now we have to systematically work our way through the table to find all of the other concordant pairs. Again, we can reduce this to kind of a mechanistic fashion and it becomes a lot easier to deal with. If we slide one cell to the left, so now we're looking people at people that responded they only had they had only some confidence in labor, but a great deal of confidence in business. We again know that anybody that's below them and to the left is concordant with them. That is, scores lower on both of those measures. And we know that because these variables are orderable, and we've had them ordered from low to high, bottom to top, left to right. So using the same logic as before, we can conclude that the 257 people in the cell we're interested in are concordant with the 405 people, that's 294 plus 111, in the cells below and to the left. And we calculate by multiplying those two numbers together, and we find out that there are 104,085 concordant pairs for that particular comparison. Now we could move over one more cell to the left to the people who have hardly any confidence in labor and a great deal of confidence in business, but you can see that there's no concordant pairs. There's nobody below them and to the left. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down, we're going to move down a row, but move back to the right. Here we have 108 people that have a great deal of confidence in labor, but only some confidence in business. Below and to the left are all the people that they are concordant with, and going through the same process as we did just before, we find out that there are 22,572 concordant pairs. We work our way through the table and we really only have one more comparison to make to find the, all of the concordant pairs. Looking at the people who have only some confidence in labor and only some confidence in business, there's only one cell that contains 111 people that's below and to the left. In total, we take all of the concordant pairs and sum them up from all these comparisons. And we get a total count of 277,459 concordant pairs. Well, what about the discordant pairs? We go through the same process, but we start from the upper left and go in the other direction. So starting at the upper left, we, find, we look at the cell of the people that responded hardly any confidence in labor and a great deal of confidence in business. Everybody below them and to the right are discordant. That is, this group of people, these 134 people, score higher on one and lower on the other. So again, going through this process and moving through the table systematically, we can easily calculate all of the discordant pairs. And in this case, we find out that there's 191,867 discordant pairs. With that information, the actual calculation of gamma is very easy. Here we go with gamma. The number of concordant pairs minus the number of discordant pairs, 85,592, divided by the number of concordant pairs plus the number of discordant pairs, 469,326, provides us a gamma statistic of 0.18. Going back to the table, that's the combination of guidelines that the book provides and guidelines that I provided, we can see that a value of 0.18 is a little bit on the border between virtually no relationship according to the book and a trivial, weak, or weak-moderate relationship according to me. One last thing. We know that gamma should be zero if there's no relationship between these two measures. We can convert that statistic, the gamma statistic, 0.18 in this example, to a z-statistic. And we can interpret as a z-statistic using a normal distri distribution how far from zero a value of 0.18 lies. You can see from the formula below, which is not very difficult, then we plug in all the appropriate numbers. If we take 0.18 and convert it to z, we get a value of 3.04. That is to say, a gamma of 0.18 is 3.04 standard deviations above the mean. If we applied our typical 0.05 um, alpha value to this, we would have a z-score of 1.96 and minus 1.96, cutting off our middle 95% of the distribution. And we would see that this particular statistic exceeds that, and we would conclude that this gamma is statistically significantly different from zero. Now you may be wondering why I show g minus a Greek gamma, and 
this is really the same thing as the numerator in our z-score. It's our observed gamma minus a population gamma, and under the null hypothesis, the population gamma is equal to zero. So g, 0.18 minus zero, leaves us with the 0.18. The last thing I want to talk about is to introduce the notion of cross table contingency table elabor elaboration or cross tab elaboration. And here we're going to be getting into the idea of post hoc statistical control. For example, when we looked at the relationship between race and capital punishment, we saw that white respondents overwhelmingly favor capital punishment compared to black respondents. Somebody might reasonably argue that the difference between white and black respondents might get smaller or disappear if we controlled for how liberal or, or conservative they are. So looking at the table at the top, I've pulled out all of the people who said they were extremely liberal and I've created the same cross tabulation of race by whether people favor or oppose capital punishment. And I've gone and calculated the odds ratio. Remember an odds ratio of one would indicate that the that the rate of approval of capital punishment is the same for black and for white. This odds ratio in fact shows us that blacks favor the capital punishment more frequently or proportionally more than whites if they're all extremely liberal. The table at the bottom on the other hand calculates the same cross tabulation data but I've pulled out only the people who said they were extremely conservative. Here we see that the odds ratio is 14. That is to say, white respondents are four the odds of a white respondent favoring capital punishment is 14 times greater than for black respondents among this group of extremely conservative individuals. We can contrast this to the overall. The overall odds ratio, if we didn't take into account whether a person is extremely liberal or extremely conservative, is 3.8. And again, the interpretation of that statistic is the odds of white respondents favoring capital punishment is 3.8 times greater than black respondents. Go back to the other table. The odds ratio for the extremely liberals is 0.89 and for the extreme conservatives is 14. In other words, we found another interesting and important variable that it's not simply enough to talk about people's attitudes about capital punishment by race but it's also important to include whether a person's, a person's personal political ideology, and in this case the direction is people who are extremely conservative tend to favor capital punishment, but much more so if they're white. One caveat to all of this, if you look carefully at the tables, you'll notice that the sample sizes are very small, particularly when we're looking at the black respondents. And of course this makes all of our findings a bit suspicious or a bit more tenuous. Let's go through the same process and look at a couple of other measures. We're still going to look at uh, whether people favor or oppose capital punishment, but we're going to break it down by race. And on the left side, we're going to control for education, low education versus high education. And on the right side, we're going to control for gender, male versus female. The top two tables in both columns represent the odds ratio of, favor of white respondents favoring capital punishment to black respondents, and we can see that's 3.7. And that's a number we've seen before. In other words, the odds of a white respondent favoring capital punishment are approximately 3.7 times greater than black respondents. Does education play a role in this? That is to say, if I were to partial out the effects of education or control for education, and just look at those people with low education or high education, would, these, would this odds ratio get larger or smaller or stay the same? You can see here that there is an education effect that among people with low education the odds ratio of white to black favoring capital punishment is 5.3. In other words the odds of a white respondent favoring capital punishment is 5.3 times greater than the black respondents. Among the high education people there's still a pretty important difference between white and black with white respondents still favoring capital punishment more than black respondents but the odds ratio drops to 2.2. Again in terms of telling a story using statistics it's not simply enough to talk about the relationship between race and attitudes about capital punishment but it's important to roll into this discussion whether a person has a low education or high education and how that affects or shapes people's opinions about capital punishment mixed with race. 
and the column on the right we're looking at the odds ratios breaking out men and women by race. Now when you look at the odds ratio for these three cross tabulations they're all about 3.7. This tells me that while I assumed there might be a relationship between gender and race and, ca and attitudes about capital punishment it doesn't appear to be true. That is to say the odds ratio for men and the odds ratio for women are virtually identical and they're very similar to the odds ratio if we ignore gender and therefore in a discussion about race and capital punishment where we've discovered it would be important to to bring education and political ideology into the discussion or into our story gender is really not a particularly important variable here when it comes to uh, discussing capital punishment I hope these videos help make sense of cross tabulation it's a lot of material particularly the information on odds ratios and probabilities and odds but as usual if you have any questions Please let us know and we'll help you out. We'll see everybody in class.